in sharing the screen. And full screen. Is this good? Can you see it? Okay. All right. So today we will wrap up bosons and move into fermions. So the last subject I want to talk about bosons is the momentum space. So uh, the idea is that we have this quantum field theory, which is described in terms of the field psi, which depends on the position. Uh, there is also a way of actually describing the momentum space and by actually just simply doing a Fourier transform. So this field psi is a function of position and time. And we do the Fourier transform, or in this case, we would rather call the mode expansion in momentum space. So what I'm doing here right now is to put the system into a box uh, in a cube of uh, each side being L. So the volume is L cube and put the everything in a periodic boundary condition that left side and right side of the box are supposed to be the same, bottom and top, front and back. So uh, this function here, the psi of X needs to satisfy the periodic boundary. So I'm writing this in terms of this A, which depends on a momenta, together with this uh, wave, uh, the, the plane wave factor. But because of this uh, the um, periodic boundary condition, this momentum vector P has to satisfy this condition that it is quantized in the unit of 2 pi h bar over L times integers in all three directions. And you probably have seen something like this in quantum mechanics class, I suppose. But the point here is that as long as these n's are integers, once x changes by L in either x direction, y direction, z direction, then this plane wave factor is periodic uh, due to this normalization of 2 pi h over L. So when you expand psi in terms of these wave vectors, then the, you, you need to satisfy this, this uh, quantization condition. So the sum over momenta would be a discrete sum. And this factor one over L to three halves is introduced for the purpose of normalization as you'll see in a moment. So this is just the expansion of psi in terms of the Fourier modes given this periodic boundary condition. So that's the totally standard thing to do. So you can do an inverse Fourier transform to write this A of P as a function of, uh, of psi integrated over space with this uh, opposite phase of this uh, wave uh, uh, vector, uh, the, the plane wave factor. And so what you can do then is to actually plug in psi uh, uh, into this Lagrangian and work it out. On the other hand, we can also work out the uh, commutation relation between A and A dagger using the canonical commutation relation between psi and psi dagger. So I just take in this inverse Fourier transform into the definition of A and A dagger. So you take the dagger of psi here and you make complex conjugate in the exponent here. So that's this expression. And as you can see, this actually greatly simplifies because psi psi dagger commutator is a delta function between X and Y. I can immediately perform Y integral and then this factor becomes e to the minus i p x over h bar times e to the plus i q dot x over h bar now because y is now x. Then you perform the x integral. The point here is that when q and p are different from each other, then this wave factor oscillates and upon x volume integral, they just cancel out and, and it leads to zero. So only when p and q vectors are exactly the same, uh, given in terms of these integers, then this exponential factors just cancel out so that becomes one integrated over x. So this whole thing just becomes the volume integral, which is L cubed, that cancels this one over L cubed so that the end result is one when P and Q are the same. Hence, this is the chronic delta between two momenta P and Q. So I chose this normalization factor of one over L three halves in such a way that a, da, a, a dagger commutator gives you one when two momenta are the same. So this is clearly, again, a uh, uh, algebra of harmonic oscillator creation and relation operators. So we can define the ground state or vacuum state by requiring that the uh, vacuum state is annihilated by an relation operator. 
then we create one particle state by using the creation operator. So this state in QFT is in one-to-one -one correspondence to the momentum eigenstate in quantum mechanics in much the same way that psi dagger x acting on the vacuum state was in one-to-one -one correspondence to the position eigenstate. So we used this property many times already, and you did two homeworks on that. So to verify that, that this state indeed does have a physical meaning of multi-particle uh, quantum mechanical state. And the linear superposition of that had the meaning of the shorting away function. So in a sense, you can create multi-particle state using this creation operators and momentum space. And then you can actually take linear superpositions of them by putting together a wave function in momentum space. Uh, uh, and, and the integrator over the P's. And so uh, that's the, the you know, again, in, in, it's just exactly the same thing you would do in momentum space in quantum mechanics. Okay, so any questions on this slide? Um, is what defines a creation operator simply the commutation relation? Yeah, and therefore so this commutation to... relation between A and A dagger being one is what defines annihilation and creation operators. Okay. And I mean, I guess there's different variants. We have it in the momentum, uh, the position, and then we also have the, uh, like the standard A and A dagger from uh, the simple harmonic oscillator. Right, that's right. And so that, uh, uh, the, the interpretation becomes, I hope, uh, clearer on the next slide, when I actually use this Lagrangian and then plug in this mode expansion straight into the Lagrangian and write everything in terms of this A of P instead of psi of x. And then end result is actually this. And the first part, I believe, uh, would make a very good sense to you now. So this part here basically tells you that A and A dagger satisfy the commutation relation as you have seen on previous slide. And because this P and that P is always the same, that they have commutator only when the momenta of A and A dagger are the same momenta. So that defines the commutation relations between A and A dagger. And this piece here uh, is basically the Hamiltonian, so PQ dot minus Hamiltonian over here, a Hamiltonian in the absence of interactions among them. And so in the absence of interactions, this is just a free particle. So whenever you create a particle with a momentum P, that gives you energy of P squared over 2M. So again, I hope that makes a very good sense to you. And A dagger A, as you know, is a number operator. So if you stick in, say, 100 particles into the same momentum states, then you gain 100 times P squared over 2M. Again, that also makes sense. So that's the, the free part of the Lagrangian. And now comes to something interesting here. So it, it takes a little bit of algebra to rewrite this interaction term together with this potential V of X minus Y by plugging in this mode expansion into Psi dagger, Psi dagger, Psi, Psi, all of these terms. And this function V of P minus Q is defined in the following way. So it's just a Fourier transform of the original potential V of X. And so writing it this way is something that appears often in, especially in condensed matter physics. In, in condensed matter physics, most people don't write Lagrangian and start straight from Hamiltonian with the understanding that A and A dagger satisfy the commutation relation on the previous slide. And for Lagrangian, you can derive the commutation relation, but when you want to start with Hamiltonian, you have to specify the commutation relation on the side so that you know what you're talking about. So assuming you have done that already. So this is the Hamiltonian now. And the first piece is again, just a free particle piece. The second piece is now interesting. So when we talked about this V of X minus Y being the interaction among particles, when we compared the QFT language and quantum mechanics language, we didn't have this kind of expression in momentum space. And this expression can be actually read off based on the following physical meaning. So suppose you have one particle coming in with momentum Q. So this operator annihilates that. And you have the second particle coming with momentum Q prime, and this operator annihilates that. So these particles are now gone. And then comes this C number function V here, which in the end actually creates two particles with momentum Pn P prime. 
And this whole process actually satisfies the overall momentum conservation. And this describes a scattering process. So particles with Q and Q prime come in, and this V represents the interaction among particles. And the particles would come out with momenta P and P prime, satisfying this momentum conservation rule. So uh, we will actually talk about this later on when we go to time-dependent perturbation theory. Uh, but now you can at least see this. The Hamiltonian, as you remember, is a time evolution operator. So Hamiltonian describes how state evolves in time. And that time evolution now involves the scattering process of two particles coming in and two particles going out. And the way they scatter among each other is specified by this Fourier transform of the potential, which represents the interaction among particles. So just by going to momentum space, you get sort of better feel on what this interaction term actually does. It does lead to this kind of scattering process. So that's new interpretation we didn't have before. Now we do. Okay, any questions about this? I was hoping that this addresses Sahil's question too. Rebecca, you're about to speak? You unmuted yourself, so no? Oh, okay, back to mute. <laughs> Any further questions? Yeah, I think uh, this is fairly straightforward and easy to understand. So just the last bit about the mode expansion, because we're gonna actually use it later on. And this is what you might have seen something similar in quantum mechanics class too. So we learned that in this periodic box, momentum vectors have to be quantized in this fashion. So when you talk about summing over all states, then in the limit where L is large, then the interval on how, what momentum, uh, 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 what various momentum vectors can take becomes smaller and smaller as one over L. So in the limit of large L, it basically becomes continuous. So this discrete sum would become a, a, a continuous integral. And we did that, we talked about Mr. Leibniz and his feud with Isaac Newton before. So this is basically a definition of this integral by stretching out the symbol of summation. And so this sum then can be replaced by this integration of smooth integral. And I can further rewrite this L cube as three dimensional volume integral in the unit of two pi h bar cubed. And this is something it is useful to remember. So this small, a large L is what is usually called the semi-classical limit, where this discreteness in quantum states is approximated by a continuum. So that's why this is called semi-classical. But in this semi-classical expression, what do you learn is that you have one quantum state in the phase space volume of dx dp over two pi h bar for each dimension. So here I'm describing cube in three dimensions. That's why both x and p are three dimensional integrals, but this is basically dx dp over two pi h bar in x direction, another dx dp over two pi h bar in y direction, yet another dx dp over two h bar in the z direction multiply on top of each other. So this is something that's very useful to remember. So in the semi-classical limit, there is one quantum state in each phase space volume measured in the unit of two pi h bar. And this is kind of another thing which really strikes me about yeah, the ingenuity of physicists back in 19th century. They didn't know quantum mechanics, but they had this idea of doing phase space integral dp dx. And dx dp phase space integral has dimension. But they actually were doing this phase space integral to sort of look at the thermodynamic limit and the statistical mechanics and so on and so forth without knowing that it, it has to be properly normalized in the unit of two pi h bar. And, and, and so after quantum mechanics was invented, so the, the kind of things that the classical physicists have been doing fell so right in place. And, and, and we now know how to use phase space volume integral, uh, literally to count the number of states. And we are going to actually use it later on. So this is something that's very useful to remember. For every dimension, 
dx dp, phase space volume, measured in two by h bar, counts the number of quantum states. Okay? And so that finishes up this brief discussion of momentum space and all the discussions about bosons. So any questions here? Okay, so now we move to fermions. Okay, so in the case of fermion, we all know they have to satisfy Pauli's exclusion principle. So major difference between bosons and fermions is that in the case of boson, many bosons can occupy the same state. And you have already seen a dramatic example of this in Bose-Einstein condensate. And that's because of this commutation relation between the A and A dagger. And so you have just discussed this in momentum space. And so A and A dagger satisfy this commutation relation, but in addition, A's commute, A daggers commute, and therefore you can use the same A dagger many times into the same state to put more and more particles into the same quantum state. So that was the special thing about boson. On the other hand, in the case of fermion, we know that, that you can do that. Only one fermion can occupy a given quantum state. So this is actually binary, whether you have a particle in there or not. So it's always zero or one, it's a binary choice. You can never have two, three, four, dot, 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 dot. So it, it, the, the quantum states are either whether the state is occupied or not occupied. It turns out this situation can be described by changing this commutation relation to anti-commutation relation. And I mentioned this earlier before, and now we are now uh, looking at it uh, straight in your face. So the commutation relation is of two uh, uh, operators, is that the square bracket A comma B is A times B minus B times A, right? So that's what we have been using all along. The definition of this anti-commutator of two operators A and B is AB plus BA instead of minus sign. So that's the definition of this curly uh, braces. So the idea here is that instead of having creation annihilation operator satisfying these commutation relations, now creation annihilation operators satisfy anti-commutation relations. So that's the idea uh, how to deal with the fermions. And of course, I don't, I haven't explained why this makes sense, and that would come on the next slide. But this is basically what you will see how we describe fermions using the creation annihilation operators, and eventually, of course, in terms of quantum field theory. Okay, any questions about this? Yeah, you know, I, I, I know the feeling. You have this wait and see attitude, right? Okay, this is a brand new uh, algebra of the creation relation operator. So let's see if that would work out. So we'll see that. By the way, yeah, so this I actually wanted to say. So I hate this name of exclusion principle. You know, you know physics sounds like, you know, exclusive club or something, uh, some sort. So I would actually propose to rename Pauli's exclusion principle to diversity principle. You know, different fermions want to be as diverse as possible. They never occupy the same state. They want to occupy different states from each other. So I believe calling that diversity principle actually makes a better sense than exclusion principle. And it sounds a lot better than exclusion principle. You know, we are not exclusive club, we are inclusive. So uh, this is what I would actually propose. Anyway, so what do these anti-commutation relations give us? So that's something we need to understand. So we define the vacuum state as usual. So vacuum state is a state that is annihilated by the annihilation operator B. So, so far, it's exactly the same as in a bosonic case. And then we go to the number state with one particle by acting creation operator on top of the vacuum state. Again, so far, it looks exact, exactly the same as what we have done in the case of boson. But when you try to create yet another particle, this is where you see the difference. Because it cannot be raised any further in the case of fermions, and this is how it works algebraically. 
So when you act creation operator on this one particle state, the one particle state was given by the creation operator acting on the vacuum state. So I have two B daggers here. So this is where you remember the definition of anti-commutator. So B dagger, B dagger, anti-commutator is, I have B daggers for operator A, B dagger for operator B. So AB plus BA is this anti-commutator. But in this case, two operators are the same. So AB is B dagger squared, BA is B dagger squared. So this anti-commutator is twice B dagger squared. And then I have a factor one half of four. So that cancels the factor of two. So this B dagger, B dagger, anti-commutator a half is exactly the same thing as B dagger twice. But what we see from this anti-commutation relations is that B dagger, B dagger, anti-commutator vanishes. So this is identically zero. So this is what I meant that this state cannot be raised any further. So once you have one particle state, trying to raise once more by acting creation operator returns zero. So now you have Hilbert space, which consists of only two states, vacuum state zero and the raised state one, and you can't raise it any further, so that's it. So, so for every mode of the fermion, fermion, you have this two dimensional Hilbert space and that's exactly what you wanted, right? So you had a binary choice of whether the state is occupied or not occupied. When it's not occupied, you use this vacuum state to describe that. When the state is occupied, you use this one particle state to describe that, but there are no other possible states for fermion. So this is how this anti-commutation relation actually works for the purpose of describing quantum mechanics of fermions. So this is where you see this anti-commutator in action. Any questions about this? You are very quiet today. Is it okay? All right. So here's one interesting thing we need to think about. So commutation relation made a good sense because if you take classical limit, they just become numbers, operators become numbers and they all commute. So the way you see it in the case of harmonic oscillator is that we actually have to do a little bit of change in normalization because we normalized creation addition operators in such a way that the commutator is one. So this way, it, it doesn't look like we can take classical limit where everything commute with each other. And of course, if you remember the lecture note and shorting of you theory, I have done the lecture note. So choose it, writing it this way, already anticipated that A and A dagger commutator comes out to be one for the, the practical useful purposes. But if you stay at this uh, uh, Lagrangian, if you wanna take classical limit, you wanna make sure that there's no H bar in a classical Lagrangian. So what you're supposed to do is to absorb this H bar into the definition of A and A dagger namely that the half H bar goes into the definition of A and A dagger, so that the Grandian now becomes free of H bar. And this is where you can take the classical limit. And indeed, in a classical limit, A dagger is just H star. The, the Euler-Lagrange equation taking a variation with respect to H star gives you I A dot minus omega A is zero. And A then uh, 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 has a time evolution going by e to the minus i omega t. So everything we know about harmonic oscillator in the classical limit, where A is, remember, x plus ip, uh, is just a phase rotation in A. So this Lagrangian contains all that piece of information in it. But using this normalization now, then A and A dagger, canonical commutation relation, of course, does have h bar in it. And A, A, A dagger, A dagger, of course, commute. But now with this normalization, I can safely take the classical limit where H bar goes to zero so that everything now commute with each other. And that's what you expect 
in classical mechanics because none of these things are operators anymore in classical mechanics. Therefore, they're just numbers and there's no issue about how to order the product between them. So that's what we know and love as the classical limit of quantum mechanical systems. So everything commutes in classical physics as expected. Any questions about this slide? I guess that's fairly obvious. So you might even wonder why I'm uh, 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 repeating this uh, trivial stuff. It, I'm doing this because when I get the fermion, it doesn't look trivial. So let's see how that changes now into a fermion. So now that you're talking about the harmonic oscillator of the fermion with this anti-commutation relation. So I go through the exact the same steps. I absorb H bar to one half power into the normalization of B and B dagger. So Lagrangian is now free of H bar. And the canonical quantization condition by using anti-commutator instead of a commutator is then this with H bar in it. And BB is still anti-commute, B dagger, B dagger still anti-commute, B and B dagger anti-commuted as H bar. Now I take the classical limit and then everything anti-commutes. So on the face of it, it looks pretty much the same thing as the, uh, the uh, bosonic harmonic oscillator, except that everything is now replaced by anti-commutator rather than commutator. So that sounds like a small change, but on the other hand, if you think about this, this is actually very strange because anti-commutators are all zero. A times B, plus B times A is all zero, which means B times A is minus A times B. When you change order among these things, you have to change signs. So that's the meaning of everything anti-commutes in classical physics. So even though I took the classical limit, this B and B dagger are very strange numbers they are meant to be not operators anymore because there's a classical limit, but they are such strange numbers. Whenever you interchange the order among them, you have to put minus sign. These are weird numbers that anti-commute among each other. Whenever you change the order of these numbers, you have to put minus sign. And you may not have heard of such a thing before, but in mathematics, there's a well-defined thing. And uh, they, in particular, because everything anti-commutes and BB anti-commutator is zero, as I mentioned on some of the uh, slides earlier, BB anti-commutator is BB plus BB, so that's twice B squared, which vanishes. So these numbers are those numbers that vanish when you take a square of any one of them. If you take square of B, that vanishes when you take a square of B dagger, that also vanishes. So these are really weird numbers. They change signs when you interchange them. When you take square of one thing, that identically vanishes. And these numbers are called Grassmann numbers. What well, to be a little bit more clear, they may be called Grassmann odd, as opposed to Grassmann even numbers, which refer to ordinary numbers that commute among each other. So these are special numbers called Grassmann odd numbers or Grassmann numbers for short, which mean that they anti-commute. Whenever you change the order between them, then you get a minus sign. Any questions about this? So let us just recap what we have done. So we chose this anti-commutation relations so that we can happily describe fermions. And we verify that it does work. It describes the quantum mechanics of fermions. But this B and B dagger we used for the purpose of describing quantum mechanics of fermions have a classical limit where the B and B dagger become numbers, but weird numbers called Grassmann odd numbers, where product with different order would give you minus sign square of any one of them would give you identically zero. So these are weird numbers, but those numbers can exist 
at least in a mathematically consistent fashion. So having told you that, I'd like to do a little poll. There's no uh, correct answer or wrong answer on this. So here we go. So you just heard of these weird numbers called Grassmann numbers. So what do you think of it? Is it interesting? Makes perfect sense? Doesn't make sense at all? Go to hell. Okay, go ahead. Mm, this is very interesting. Okay. So most of you found a positive attitude that this is actually interesting. And two of you said it, it makes perfect sense. That's, that's wonderful. Well, one of you said it doesn't make sense at all. And, and nobody was as uh, mean to say to go to hell. So that's how I, I also appreciate that. So anyway, so these are interesting numbers you may not have seen before. But I just would like to remind you that you have been there before. You know, just re uh, remember when you first learned of imaginary number, the square root of minus one. Was it when, when was this? Middle school, high school? I don't know. Depending on where you're from, I guess. But when you first learned of imaginary number, I'm sure you felt this way. This is exactly how I felt myself. That, you know, it was probably of no any practical use such a number doesn't exist. The mathematician just invented for the purpose of solving the quadratic equation, but these things are just fictitious, it doesn't exist. And after all, it is called imaginary number. So it's purely imaginary in the sense that it doesn't exist. And, and that's how I felt when I first saw this imaginary number and comp complex number in general. But now you use it every day in quantum mechanics, right? The Schrodinger equation has I in it. And you got used to that. So in this case, I was introduced just for the purpose of finding a solution to the quadratic equation, x squared e equals to minus one. And solutions are I and minus I. And the mathematicians invented it for the purpose of trying to force the equation to have a solution by expanding the idea of numbers. But those numbers are something we rely on every day in quantum mechanics. So I exists. I is no longer imaginary. We use it every day. So the, this, the Grassmann number is also the same way. Somehow, Mother Nature likes to use bizarre numbers, like imaginary number or Grassmann numbers, as long as they are mathematically consistent. And I don't know why Mother Nature has that kind of a taste, but that's apparently what she does. And in order to describe the physical world, we have to accept that these numbers are actually in use, chosen by Mother Nature. So we accept imaginary number whenever we write down the Schrodinger equation. Now we accept new kind of number called the Grassmann number that anti-commutes and squares to zero. So it's something we need to get used to now because we haven't used it very much before. You, you may never have seen it before, but nonetheless, this is what we use for the purpose of describing fermions. Okay, any questions about this? Uh, professor, I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, so for bosons, you can use the harmonic oscillators to define a in terms of x and p, but mm -hmm. for if if the harmonic oscillator uh, is for the electrons, then how, how can you use a and p to define the b uh, b operator? Yeah, so so, you just, so certainly you can write b as x plus i p, and you you can do that, but you have to accept something weird again. So x squared is zero. P squared is zero. And X and P anti-commute to one. So that's the definition of X and P now. So you can write uh, the, uh, the B and B dagger in terms of X and P if you like, but it doesn't give you the kind of Hamiltonian you know and love, namely X squared plus P squared. If you do that, that's identically zero, right? So your yeah. Hamiltonian ends up being xp plus px. 
So that's, that's the Hamiltonian you get. So you can do it, but it doesn't give you sort of anything more intuitive than what we are doing here with B and B dagger. So in the end, we don't do it. You can do it, but we don't do it simply because you don't gain anything by doing that. Am I answering but, your question? But in, uh, but in usual quantum mechanics class, we still, we, we don't specify uh, whether the particles in the harmonic potential is boson or fermions. I mean, like we, can, we can still use electrons in a uh, harmonic, also, uh, harmonic potential, then we still write something like uh, a half x squared plus a half b squared. Yeah, that's because yeah, in quantum mechanics, harmonic oscillator uh, didn't have anything to do with creating an ion particles, right? So A and A dagger was just meant to go to next step up, next step down. There was no interpretation of that being a particle, simply because it was quantum mechanics. We have this interpretation that A and A dagger we literally creates particles, annihilates particles, only because you made a jump into quantum field theory. So in quantum mechanics, there was no notion of creating particles, annihilating particles. So there was no notion of Fermi states being occupied or unoccupied. Your Hilbert space already had a fixed number of particles in it. You don't change the number of particles. So within the Hilbert space of fixed number of particles, then only thing you have to do is anti-symmetrize the wave function, which we are going to actually verify also from the QFT side in a couple of slides. <coughs> so the, the harmonic oscillator in the standard quantum mechanics has no notion of Fermi on a boson. Another way of saying the same thing is that when you write harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics, you use X and P, but you implicitly assumed that x and x commute. x squared is not zero, and p and p commute. p squared doesn't vanish. So you already had this idea of treating x and p correctly in the classical limit as commuting numbers. Nobody told you so, but because that's the only number you knew, you, had, you actually implicitly assumed that. And based on that assumption, how many oscillators came out to be the Hilbert space with an infinite number of states. If we had learned about Grassmann numbers back in elementary school, then the minute you see the, uh, the harmonic oscillator, you would wonder, is this a commuting number or anti-commuting number? And if this were anti-commuting number, you would have quantized in a different way. But you just didn't know before. And now you do. So when you, whenever you see a Lagrangian Hamiltonian, one of the first question you have to ask then is, okay, I, I have this A and A dagger in this Hamiltonian, but do they satisfy commutation relation or anti-commutation relation? So that's the first question you should ask when you see a Hamiltonian. So now that you learn that there's this bizarre number, which is mathematically fairly consistent and, and every field and operator can be such a Grassmann odd number in the classical limit, depending on which choice you make, whether an object is commuting or anti-commuting, whether the object is Grassmann even or Grassmann odd, you have different set of quantum systems as a result of that choice. So that's something you didn't know before, but now you do, and you should ask that question every time you see Hamiltonian. Does that answer your question, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, it's answered my question, thank you. Okay, any other questions here? <clears throat> Okay, so we sort of get, get used to it more. But whenever I talk about I, an imaginary number, I always feel funny because in the Japanese language I, uh, uh, I grew up with, the, the I actually is a, a, a represented by this symbol, which means love. So as you can see, quantum mechanics is full of love. So uh, that's a good thing to remember. So, what about quantization in general then? So whenever you see a Lagrangian like this one, we just immediately went to the commutation relation between psi and psi dagger by focusing on this first term here, by taking the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the time derivative of the variable, you define the canonical con conjugate momentum, and we went ahead and wrote down the commutation relation. <clears throat> but now that you have learned 
that there's this weird number called Grassmann numbers, you first, you first need to ask the question, okay, I'm staring at this Lagrangian of the field theory, but is Psi meant to be Grassmann even number or Grassmann odd number? So that's a choice. And when somebody hand, hand, hands you the Lagrangian, then you should ask back, is this Grassmann even or odd? Otherwise, you don't know how to deal with it. <clears throat> and once you get told that this is a Grassmann even number, <clears throat> then you quantize this Lagrangian to introduce this commutation relation. And again, if you absorb square root of h by to the definition of psi psi dagger, this has h bar in it. In the classical limit, this goes to zero and everything commutes with each other. So that's the classical limit of Grassmann even numbers. But if that person tells you that, okay, I give you this Lagrangian, but I, what I meant was that this psi is supposed to be Grassmann odd numbers. Then you know what to do. You quantize it with the anti-commutation relations. Again, if you absorb square root of h bar into definition of psi and psi dagger, there's a h bar on the right hand side, which vanishes in the classical limit where everything now anti-commute. <clears throat> so that's the quantization you're supposed to do in that case. So depending on this psi, which describes this classical Lagrangian is Grassmann even number, namely ordinary number, or Grassmann odd numbers, which is really an odd number, uh, as the, the word odd says, all right? So it's a weird number, but that, that you know exactly what to do. So given the choice of whether the field is Grassmann even or Grassmann odd, you introduce commutation relations or anti-commutation relations. So that's the way we quantize the system. And just to give you a general rule uh, about mathematical consistency here, whenever you have two numbers, both of them Grassmann even, you use commutator, as I talked about. Whenever you have two Grassmann odd numbers, you use anti-commutator, as I talked about. I haven't mentioned what you're supposed to do when you have the product of something Grassmann even and something Grassmann odd. In this case, you are supposed to use commutator because Grassmann even object is basically just a number. So number times this weird, uh, the Grassmann odd thing, it doesn't matter where number is multiplied from the front or back, it's the same thing. So even objects and odd objects do commute. It doesn't matter in which order you write. So the only time you have to worry about the ordering between two objects in a product is when both of them are Grassmann odd. So in that case, when you interchange the order, you're supposed to put minus sign in front of it. So that's the rule. So whenever you see a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian handed over to you, you need to know whether the variables in that Lagrangian Hamiltonian were Grassmann even or Grassmann odd. And when it's Grassmann odd, then you use anti-commutation relations to quantize the system. And the general rule is that you have to be aware of the ordering between these operators and you put minus sign when in you interchange two Grassmann odd objects, but otherwise the ordering doesn't matter. So that's the general rule. Okay, any questions about this? Um, I guess I just had a general question about okay. Lagrangians in this uh, scenario. So mm -hmm. um, in the classical limit where we just take psi to be a field um, and we solve the Euler Lagrange equation, we get um, mm -hmm. an equation that describes like phenomena such as boson sign uh, condensate. But mm -hmm. If we quantize it, um, is there is there any like meaning ascribed to the solution of a Euler Lagrange equation after this uh, field is quantized or no? Um, there is. So the way we actually, uh, so that's an excellent question. So for example, we solved the Euler Lagrange equation classically and the uh, um, uh, uh, identified, for example, a, a Bose-Einstein condensate or its flowing, uh, moving solution. And we looked at the excitations on top of that, which satisfies this Bocoluvo spectrum. And the way we dealt it with it is, is by looking at the classical equation of motion and did the linearization and identified the relationship between the angular frequency and the wave vector. And that's how we identify the Bocoluvo spectrum. <clears throat> 
But when you actually do it in terms of the operators, what you're supposed to do is to take the Lagrangian and expand psi as a classical solution you found plus the correction, then this correction piece is an operator. So classical solution plus operator. You stick that into the Lagrangian, into psi. So psi now has both classical solution and the operator piece in it. And rewrite the entire Lagrangian and keep the terms up to the quadratic order and discard the cubic term and quadratic term and so on and so forth. And then you have a Lagrangian that's purely quadratic in terms of this correction operator. Let me call that delta psi and delta psi dagger. And then you quantize it. And that quantization actually gives you the Hilbert space where you satisfy this Bogolyubov uh, uh, dispersion relation between energy and momentum. So what do you have done with the classical linearization analysis in a homework problem? is something you could have done using operators, but then you have to actually put in both classical solution and the correction of the operator away from the classical solution and keep the quadratic pieces of Lagrangian and quantize it. So it actually turns out to give you exactly the same answer. And so if you look at the lecture notes, I did it both ways. And the second way actually does require this Bogolyubov of transformation, which Reggie talked about in discussion section. I don't plan to cover this just because of lack of time, but it's in the lecture notes. So I hope you read up on it. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, so I guess after we introduce the correction term, do we solve for it again with the euler lagrange equation? Yeah, so if you actually do that, you simply find that this uh, correction operator changes by its phase where time dependence is given by the angular frequency and spatial dependence given by the wave vector, which satisfy this Bogolyubov of spectrum. Okay, thanks. Okay, good. Any other questions? All right, so now we learned the quantization rule. And now this is the point where we really verify that this QFD does describe the fermions in a way we knew back in quantum mechanics class. So this is the slide I have used back on September 11th. And this is a slide where I demonstrated that this linear superposition you take to define a general two particle state is given in terms of a function that's invariant or symmetric under the interchange of particles. And the source of this symmetry under interchange of two particles was actually here, where you interchange the order of two creation operators, and using the fact that they commute, I put psi dagger x1 now on the right, psi dagger x2 on the left, without changing this product, because they commute. And then noting the fact that x1, x2 are dummy variables of integration, I relabeled them so that this product of operators goes back to where I started, but this coefficient function capital psi now has these two arguments interchanged and nothing changes throughout this process. And therefore this psi, which now has the meaning of multi-particle wave function in quantum mechanics is automatically symmetric under the interchange of particles. So that's what we have done back in September 11 for the bosons. What changes now? I'm sure that's clear to you now. When you interchange these two psi daggers, they anti-commute. So when you interchange them and write them in the opposite order, now you need to put a minus sign up front. And from the second line to third line, what I'm doing is to ch just relabeling the dummy variables for integration. So from here to there, nothing changes. So I need to keep this minus sign. Now I compare the first line and the third line. Everything in front of this capital Psi are the same. But now the arguments of capital Psi are interchanged at the expense of having negative sign up front now, which we didn't have before for the bosons, but now we do. And therefore, this capital Psi is anti-symmetric 
under the interchange of two arguments. And that's exactly what you learned what to do in a case of multiparticle wave function for identical fermions, right? So just like in the case of boson where the wave function was automatically symmetric and the interchange of particles, now you see the wave function is automatically anti-symmetric and the interchange of identical fermions. So once again, you see the same fact, namely the QFD has the quantum statistics built in. You don't enforce anti-symmetry of the multiple wave function by hand, like what you used to do in quantum mechanics class. In QFT, the anti-symmetry of the wave function is really built in. And that goes back to the fact that these creation and relation operators satisfy the anti-commutation relation in the case of fermions. So I hope this part is now sort of a, 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 a the old machinery for you. We have seen this already many times and you wrote down the Schrodinger equation for this multiparticle wave function. So it should be obvious to you now that this capital Psi does satisfy the multiparticle Schrodinger equation for identical fermions now, given the anti-symmetry and the interchange of identical fermions in this multiparticle state. Okay, let me pause here and see if there are any questions. So, um, we still have to enforce the anti-symmetry ourselves, like for the um, the capital psi. Wait, I mean not the the state, but the function in the integral. Like, do do we have to ensure ourselves that that's anti-symmetric, or because I, I guess I'm just not seeing where the anti-symmetry of the psi like function in the like just the weighting of the wave function comes in yeah so that's a good question automatically Anna. right suppose you chose this function to be not clearly symmetric and symmetric so this function doesn't have particular symmetry with x1 x2 say but arbitrary function of two arguments x2 and x2 can always be written as a sum of symmetric part and anti-symmetric part so symmetric part is half psi x1, x2 plus psi x2, x1. That's obviously symmetric. And the symmetric part is half psi x1, x2 minus psi x2, x1. And that's obviously anti-symmetric. And if you sum them up, psi x2, x1 cancels. So you recover the original psi x1, x2. So if you take this to be arbitrary function, I can view this as a sum of symmetric part and anti-symmetric part. But after doing this uh, uh, manipulation, what you see is that symmetric part actually vanishes because symmetric part multiplied with psi dagger x1 and psi dagger x2, you integrate over them. This part is anti-symmetric between x1 and x2. So symmetric part actually drops out completely after doing x1, x2 integral. The only anti-symmetric part remains as a result of this integral. So that's what I meant to be automatic. So once you actually go to QFT and define a general two particle state this way, then symmetric part doesn't contribute to the state. Only anti-symmetric part does. And therefore, even if you don't try to enforce the anti-symmetry in Psi, the symmetric part just drops out completely and only anti-symmetric part remains so at the end of the day, it's automatically anti-symmetric. So that's what I meant. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Great, thank you, Anna. Any further questions here? Good, so pretty much all the machinery we have done before in comparing QFD and quantum mechanics are still exactly the same, just except for this point that Whenever you interchange creation operators, you pay a price of a sign, and therefore, multiparticle wave function is anti-symmetric under interchange of identical fermions. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. The homework, uh, previous homeworks we have done in writing down Schrodinger equation for capital Psi is also exactly the same as before. Now, we start to actually put in a chemical potential. And then 
you already realize that this is where the, uh, the, uh, there's a huge difference between bosons and fermions. When you put in a positive chemical potential, if this psi were bosons, without putting the interaction term in, then this, remember, this is the negative of the potential for the field, which is now minus mu psi leg of psi. So potential is unbounded from below. And this is a situation where you have the bose einstein condensate collapses and, and undergoes Bosnova, right? So that's why we uh, uh, looked at in movie uh, from the experimental data. So putting in positive chemical potential is already, oops, we can't do this without having interaction. It turns out that this is totally okay in a case of fermions, and that's a huge difference between bosons and fermions. And you see how that works by writing it out in the momentum space very easily. So if you go to the momentum space and write down the Hamiltonian, you, know, you just stick in this uh, mode expansion of psi as you have done for Fermi uh, bosons before, then this is the expression for the Hamiltonian. Here's so you have A dagger A and P square of two M or minus mu. And now you see this would be problematic for bosons because for low momenta, this combination in the parentheses is negative, which means if you put more and more particles into that same state P, you can keep lowering energies and therefore your system has no ground state. You keep adding particles and you keep lowering the energy of the state. And that's exactly what we have seen in this collapse of the bose einstein condensate. When you turn off the repulsive interactions, then system collapses because all the states want to go into the lowest mode where momentum vanishes. This is the most negative when P is zero and you stick in all the particles into the state and everything collapses. So in the case of bosons, this system is ill-defined. We can't make sense out of that. But in the case of fermion, that's different. So this is what I just said, because you can put arbitrary number of bosons into the state. I'm sorry, I went too fast. So this is because you can put more bosons into the states where this is negative to lower the energy arbitrarily and so there's no well-defined ground state to the system. So that's what we have seen in the case of the bosons. But if you are dealing with fermions instead, situation is totally different because even though you have this combination being negative, you cannot put more than one particle in there. So the idea of trying to find the ground state is that whenever this parenthesis is positive, if you put a particle into that mode, you raise the energy, so you'd rather not. You don't put a particle in there. But if this the thing in parentheses is negative, you'd rather put a particle into that mode to lower the energy. But having put in one particle into the mode to lower the energy, you can't do that anymore because it's a fermion. So it stops. So that defines a well-defined ground state. Namely, you use the vacuum state for those modes where P square over 2M minus mu is positive because putting a particle would cost you energy. You don't want to do that. But for those modes when, where P square 2M minus mu is negative, you'd rather put a particle into that mode because you gain energy by doing so. So this is the well-defined ground state even for a positive chemical potential which was not possible for bosons. Namely, your state looks like this. So when the momentum is low, below certain critical value called Fermi momentum, P squared over, over 2M minus mu is negative for those momenta, then you put in a fermion, you occupy that state. But for those modes where momentum is bigger than Fermi momentum, where P squared of 2M minus mu is positive, you don't occupy the state. You keep it vacant, open. So your ground state is now defined in this way that you occupy all those states of the momenta up to a certain value, 
where pf squared of 2m equals chemical potential mu. But above that momenta, you don't occupy those states. So that's the idea. So this is actually what is called a Fermi degenerate C, uh, or Fermi liquid. So even, even though this uh, positive chemical potential would correspond to low temperature and high density configuration of many, many particles in the system, the, this uh, it looks actually a lot simpler than the Bose-Einstein condensate we talked about, which does require dealing with the interactions, and that leads to the coherent state and Bogoliubov transformation and all that. So the fermion ground state is a lot simpler. You just simply occupy states all the way up to certain state, the critical state, where the energy of the state equals the chemical potential. And interactions among the fermions are not expected to modify this picture very much because these states are all occupied. Once it's occupied, you can't occupy it anymore. So even though the particles may be interacting with each other, once state is occupied, it is occupied. Once state is vacant, it is vacant. So everything in here is it's not subject to much change, even if you deal with the interacting system. Now that I said it, you probably noticed that there may be something that can happen near this point because interaction may move this particle over there and back. So near the Fermi surface, we call, this is the Fermi surface, because if you think of the three-dimensional uh, momentum space, Px, P1, Pz, and this Fermi momentum would form a sphere. So this edge is a surface, two-dimensional sphere, and the particles can go in and out when they interact. So something interesting can still happen near the Fermi surface, but for the bulk of these states, which may have Avogadro number of electrons in it, the interactions are expected, not expected to modify this state very much. Once it's occupied, it is occupied. Nothing can change, really. So that's the picture of what is called the Fermi liquid. And you define what is called the Fermi energy, up to which you occupy all states. So in the case of free particle, the energy is just given by P squared over 2m, and we occupy it up to the Fermi momentum. Once you have a system in a crystal, then energy may be a little bit more complicated function of momentum, but idea is still the same. You just keep occupying all the states until the energy of the state becomes equal to the chemical potential. And so this critical value of the energy is called the Fermi energy. So that's what happens in the case of the fermions with positive chemical potential. Positive chemical potential with the boson was very non-trivial, was unstable. You had to put in an interaction to stabilize it, and that led to the Bose-Einstein condensate, which is the coherent state of the uh, 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 annihilation operator. He has this macroscopic wave-like behavior. Lots of interesting things happen there. But for the case of fermions, it's just simple idea of occupy all the states up to the Fermi energy. And this entire system is then called Fermi degenerate in a sense that you just packed states all the way up to the Fermi energy. There's no sort of a, a, a wiggle room in there. And that's the, the word uh, meaning of the word degenerate. So you are now looking at the state which is Fermi degenerate, where all the states up to the Fermi energy are now occupied. OK, any questions about this? Um, is this only a single particle state that we're, I guess, considering here for the ground state? So I'm defining the ground state for macroscopic number of states, actually. So up to the Fermi energy, I may have Avogadro number of electrons in here. So this is meant to be the ground state of multi-particle system because we're doing QFT. So we are occupying every momentum mode up to this Fermi energy, and we do not occupy every momentum mode above that uh, the Fermi energy. And so you have the tensor product of occupied state for mode one, occupied state for mode two, occupied state for mode three, and so on and so forth, all the way up to Fermi energy. So I keep using this state one for all of those modes up to this energy. 
and I, I use this uh, the vacuum state zero for all the most above this energy. So my ground state is a product of a bunch of zeros and ones for every momentum eigenstates or energy eigenstates. So it's a multi-particle ground state. Oh, I see. So, so for each mode, we have a particle meaning one or no particle meaning zero. And right, exactly. depending on where you are in that mm -hmm. scale. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, right. So, so this is, again, the power of quantum field theory. So I'm writing now the wave function of Avogadro number of particles in it. And in quantum mechanics, you, you can't do that. You know, if you start with psi of x1, x2, x3, x4, dot, 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 dot. And you have to keep writing until you come to the x of 6 and 10 to 23rd. That's the wave function. And nobody would do that. It would take your entire lifetime to finish writing it. But in QFT, this is it. You just say, I used the vacuum state for these momentum modes. I used this, the occupied state, for those momentum modes. And the product for all of them is all I need to do. So that's the beauty of QFT, where you can deal with this multi-particle state and identify ground state just by these two lines and nothing else. Okay, any further questions on this? Okay, good. And this kind of idea is probably familiar to those of you uh, who have been studying condensed matter physics it, because that's exactly what, for example, a piece of metal does. And so uh, uh, let me just go through this. So we know that momentum modes in this periodic box uh, come in these quantized values. And you can count up the number of states up to this Fermi energy. And so by replacing the sum of the momenta by the momentum integral I talked about earlier by a semi-classical uh, approximation, which corresponds to large L limit, then you can do this integral in a three-dimensional sphere and just rewrite it and so that you obtain the total number of states occupied up to this Fermi energy. Namely that you just count the number of states up to the point where p squared over 2m becomes mu. So that requirements give you this as the total number of particles because these number of states are meant to be occupied. Above those states, they are not occupied, so I don't need to add anything more. So total number of states is nothing but the to total number of particles is nothing but the total number of states up to the Fermi energy. So that's the condition I used here. Okay, so I hope you can see it. So once mu is p squared over 2m, 2m mu is p squared, and square root of that is p. So using this condition that mu is given by this Fermi momentum pf, I'm just rewriting pf in terms of mu, and that's what the square root thing is. And then you are looking at the volume of a sphere in the three-dimensional momentum space, and that's four pi over three times Fermi momentum to the cube. That's the volume. But the volume needs to be defined in the unit of two pi h bar. So that's this denominator over here for a given volume size of L. So that's how you can identify how many particles you can put into states below the Fermi surface. So that's how many particles you got which is meant to be macroscopic numbers. So now that I've moved this L to the other side and divided by L cube, so now I know what the number density is. So I just rewrote this M mu of third power as with square root by M times mu of three halves power. And so by taking the square root out into this half exponent here, then I have to take the square of the denominator so that's how I arrive at this expression by canceling one factor of two between denominator and numerator, leaving one factor of two downstairs. So this is the number density written in terms of this uh, the Fermi energy or chemical potential mu. So now let's estimate that. In a piece of metal, you have all the ions lined up, like let's say in the case of iron atoms, you have the iron 
uh, uh, ion, uh, iron, iron. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, it is correct, right? So that's the positive ion, iron, leaving uh, the electrons out from the, uh, the atom. And that's all lined up neatly in a crystal. And typical interatomic spacing in a crystal is a few angstroms. So as a result, you expect to have the number density of electrons to be one in a cube of a few electrons or angstroms. So if that's the number density, then you can just plug that into here. And so this is the number density you know, one per a few angstroms. Then you can work out what mu is. And mu in the unit of Boltzmann constant turns out to correspond to the 10,000 Kelvins. So temperature in the room is something like 100 kelvins, which is so much lower, so much colder compared to the energy at the Fermi surface. And if the temperature is high enough, you may be able to excite some of the electrons near the Fermi surface and, and to uh, go up above and come back. And so this Fermi surface may get blurred a little bit. But room temperature is so low compared to this energy, then this distribution becomes very rigid. So room temperature is very cold from the point of view of electrons in a piece of metal. And when you apply electric field on top of it, the electric field would allow you to take one electron below the surface to above the surface and make it move and that's how the electric current would flow in a piece of metal. And so that's actually one example of this Fermi degenerate system. So to a good approximation, you just pack electron all the way up to the Fermi energy, which corresponds to 10,000 Kelvin. It's very high energy. And you don't occupy any of the states above that number. And it's very rigidly packed box or sphere of some sort and that is the meaning of this Fermi degenerate state. So the piece of metal is an example of this macroscopic number of electrons in this Fermi degenerate state, occupying all the way up to the Fermi energy and nothing above. Okay, any questions about this? Probably many of you have seen something like this in, in some other classes. Okay, so this is how you use fermions to describe a piece of metal. Now I must, must switch my gear to use the Fermi degenerate state to describe a star. So this is just cartoon, but this is something, you know, it will be fun to know. So suppose you have a star of various different sizes and different masses. Very small one, called brown dwarfs would shine by nuclear fusion process, but it just keeps dimming all the way and eventually would be invisible at the end of the day. Slightly more massive stars called red dwarfs also take sort of similar weight, well, similar, similar fate, but at the end of the day, it leaves a tight core called white dwarfs. And the same is true with our sun. So it keeps shining because of the nuclear fusion process happening at the core. And eventually our sun uses up all the hydrogen. And then it may start actually also fusing helium a little bit further into oxygen or carbon, but it would not go any further. Once the nucleus becomes big enough, they have a large electric charges in the case of oxygen, that's eight. And there's a big Coulomb barrier for them to come together so the fusion process doesn't happen unless there's an incredible gravity by the mass of the star. And sun doesn't have that kind of mass, so nuclear fusion process would stop somewhere around uh, carbon and, and oxygen. So then nuclear fusion doesn't happen anymore, so you can't support the gravity of its own mass anymore. So the core of the sun would shrink. And that core is what becomes the state called the white dwarf the rest of the star would bounce back and, and become a, a much bigger. The sun becomes as big to the extent of as swallowing up our planet. So that's the end of the world as we know it. We get swallowed by the sun 
well, at least we get incinerated by the approaching surface of the sun. We wouldn't be able to live on our planet anymore, which is the fate that's waiting for us in about four and a half billion years. So, you know, young people like you should worry about that. But at the end of the day, again, there is this remnant called white, white dwarfs. Some much bigger stars would actually end up in a huge explosion called a supernova. And that's what I mentioned earlier in connection with the Bosnova. And if the mass is not too big, it would still leave a remnant called the neutron star, which is the pulsars that actually pulsates in radio. And uh, uh, you might have actually listened to a uh, lecture by <coughs> Jocelyn Bell, who, is, uh, who uh, discovered pulsars when she was a graduate student, but missed Nobel Prize. But anyway, so uh, that's the kind of star that may get left over. If the original mass is very large, it, the supernova explosion happens, everything else inside collapses, and then form eventually a black hole. So this is the fate of stars, depending on what kind of mass they got. And for a sun-like star, then the core of the star eventually becomes a white dwarf. So as I emphasized already, white dwarf doesn't have any nuclear fusion process anymore. So how can the entire mass of the star be supported against the gravitational pull? If nothing goes against gravity, everything collapses to a black hole, but what I'm saying is that it doesn't. So something has to work against gravity. Something needs to exert pressure. That pressure actually turns out to be exactly this Fermi degenerate state. So once nuclear fusion uh, stops, there's no heat generated uh, from the nuclear fusion process. The only way you can support the entire mass of the star is by Fermi degeneracy pressure of electrons. And this is what is called the hydrodynastatic equilibrium. So the uh, white dwarf is tiny. This is actually a tiny speck compared to the size of the sun or some other ordinary stars in the universe. And so this is a tiny, tiny object where pretty much the entire mass of the sun collapses into. This is a very dense object. It's called compact object in astronomy. And this compact object, of course, is compact because of gravitational pull. But it is supported. It doesn't collapse any further because there's a pressure working against it. And the pressure comes from the fact that you have packed electrons all the way up to some Fermi surface. And if you try to squeeze it any further, then, then you have to pack more particles into the state, which requires you raise the Fermi energy and that will cost you energy. So gravity wants to make the star smaller, but this Fermi degenerate state wants to make the star bigger and they balance somewhere in between. And that's the analysis that was done by a uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar. And, and so if you actually go to higher Fermi momentum, you think you can support higher masses, but very quickly, in a star like this one, the Fermi momentum turns out into uh, uh, much bigger than the mass times the uh, electron times the speed of light, which means the Fermi momentum becomes in, in a relativistic regime. Here, you may still have relativistic electrons, but the bulk of states end up being relativistic. And once you actually put that in, it turns out that mass cannot exceed certain value called the Chandrasekhar limit. And uh, this is actually worked out in, in quite a bit of detail in lecture notes. I encourage you to look at that. But I give you on the next slide just the, uh, the, the, um, the quick, and back, quick and dirty back of envelope estimate so you see how that works. And as a result of this uh, work, Chandrasekhar received normal prize. So this explanation may not make sense to you. So let me just go straight to this back of envelope estimate. So this is how things work. So let's say this M is the mass of the star, R is its radius. So just a simple estimate of how much energy is associated with the gra gravitational pull is given by this Newton's constant M squared over R, right? That's the gravitational potential. So that's an approximation. It's a very, I meant to be just a crude estimate. And the mass of the star is given by the number of electrons times the mass of the nucleons like protons and neutrons. For each electron, there's supposed to be at least one proton. There may be also additional neutron, then it is probably twice as, as much. But roughly speaking, the mass is given by number of electrons 
times the mass of the proton or neutron. So now we look at this number of electrons when all the states up to Fermi momentum is occupied. So we do a very crude estimate. So roughly speaking, this is volume in space and volume in momentum space measured in the unit of each ball, right? So that's the number of electrons. So we know it can express the mass of the star using the Fermi momentum and the size of the star. On the other hand, the energy of electrons which is packed all the way up to Fermi momentum, assuming that that's already relativistic, so the kinetic energy is C times P, I just integrate again over up to the Fermi momentum like what I did on for this number, but now this additional factor of Cp in there. So kinetic energy as a whole, by adding all the electrons in the star, would be given by this, compared to number, they have additional factor of C and Pf. So that's the kinetic energy. So balance between the kinetic energy that wants to expand the star and gravitational energy that wants to make the star more smaller would be when they balance against each other. Again, it's a very crude estimate. And by taking them to equal to each other, I can solve for mass by eliminating Pf and R. It turns out that I can do that. And then I find the mass of the star to be given by Newton's constant h bar and c and the mass of the, the proton. And this crude estimate gives you something like 10 to the 30th kilograms. And lo and behold, mass of the sun is about that. So this is you know really amazing thing that all you are doing is to do the math of this Fermi degenerate state in quantum mechanics, but just by equating that energy of the Fermi degenerate state to the gravitational energy, you can work out the mass of a star that comes into the white ballpark as the mass of the sun. So simple quantum mechanics allows you to compute the mass of a star called white dwarfs. So that's really amazing thing about this concept of the Fermi degenerate state. It works in a piece of metal, it works in a star because the laws of physics is common to both. The only thing you need to know is that in the case of fermions, positive chemical potential is not a problem. You just stack up all the states up to the Fermi energy of chemical potential, and that's all you need to know. And that idea works both in the sky and both on our planet. So let me stop here to see if there are any questions about this. Uh, professor, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, so in the expression of kinetic energy, you use the dispersion, linear dispersion relation, but for those- CP, yes. Yeah, but for those P, uh, which, is, which are very small, you should use a P squared instead of like C times. That's right, P. yeah. But for the vast majority of this integral, only region very tiny, would give you p of 2m, where electron is still non-relativistic. And, and for vast majority of the integral, they, they are all super relativistic, it turns out. So this is a okay. good approximation. So as I said, this is crude, back of envelope, but this even at this crude level, you get more or less the right number as a Chandrasekhar derived like in 1930 or something. Okay, thank you. So, you know, if you're on the road, you, if you don't remember the, the mass of the sun, you can work it out now. Okay, any other questions? Um, is, I guess the right way to think about, um, I guess the Fermi degeneracy is that there's a Fermi on our, I guess an electron in this case, for each um, momentum mode, rather than being a fixed number of electrons that are distributed amongst this, amongst the possible momentum. Is it that like for each momentum, there's a corresponding electron occupying the appropriate uh, energy level? Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. Okay. And, and if you are really sort of picky about this, I should have put in a factor of two in here, for example, because for each momentum state, you can put electrons with spin up or spin down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when we say mode, you know, this has to be sum over all momentum and spin of each particle 
And, and with that definition, of course, you still are allowed to put only one electron in each of those moles. Yeah. But otherwise, exactly as you said. Yep. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay, good. So I post a new homework problem later today. And I hope you are getting pretty much done with the current homework problem. And, uh, and yep, have a good weekend and stay safe.